boy here we go talking about indian military equipment it's like a death sentence on the youtube world in all honesty it doesn't matter what you say about indian military equipment good or bad you're going to get absolutely destroyed in the comments i actually made a video quite recently about the uh, tejas uh, aircraft and how, how i actually liked it and it gets a lot of hate and trying to disprove those who hate the aircraft but it blew up i don't know what it is about the Indian military is following, but you can't do anything or say anything without being absolutely burned to life. So I'm going in this with a open mind. Hopefully those who are watching can take this. I appreciate you stopping by today. Before we get into the thickness of today's video, what is your favorite infantry fighting vehicle of the world? Because we are talking fighting vehicle is one of the most difficult niches to fill and engineering and design requirements to fill for the modern battle age. But let's talk a little bit about this FICV program. It began almost a decade ago in 2009 when the Indian Army recognized the need for a replacement for the BMP-2s. The goal was simple on paper but very ambitious to practice. To develop a fully indigenous, next generation infantry fighting vehicle capable of meeting the demands of a very sophisticated modern setup for IFEs of today. Initially, the project outlined some really lofty expectations. The FICV would need to be amphibious, offer advanced armor protection, carry a range of weaponry, including a 30mm cannon, anti-tank guided missiles, remote controlled weapon stations, and kind of envisioned as the perfect blend of mobility, firepower, and survivability. And that's any designer or engineer's requirement for an IFE of today, but that is a very difficult requirement to fill for today's needs, particularly in just an indigenous setup. Despite these ambitions, the project has seen countless hurdles and a really struggling setup to get this vehicle in place. Changes in leadership, evolving battlefield requirements, and delays in decision making have all contributed to the program's, in all honesty, stagnation. But the dream remains alive. The Indian defense companies like Tata, LT, and DRDO competing to deliver the prototype worthy of the Army's trust is actually something that I think will eventually happen. I think it's pretty fair to say, and those of you who are probably screaming and typing out in the comments right now are already trying to flame me, that the project has become a symbol of both hope and frustration in the Indian defense circles. So what's the real reason why this program has become so difficult? Well, one of the biggest challenges is bureaucracy. Defense procurement in India is notoriously slow with endless red tape and decision paralysis. Even after the Defense Acquisition Council approved the FIC project in 2009, it took nearly a decade for concrete steps to even emerge. Another issue is the rapidly changing requirements. The modifications that they keep changing to the needs of this vehicle is endless. The Army keeps modifying the vehicle to adapt to all these new threats, electronic warfare, drones, and the designers can't keep up. It's once again just like Pentagon Wars. But the constant changes to specs mean manufacturers are left scrambling to meet the shifting demands, and manufacturers do not like that. It just makes a lot of extra work, slows things down, and to be honest, defense manufacturers, they will go to the highest bidder and the project that makes the most sense. It's just the way it goes. Lastly, the technological challenge cannot be overstated. Developing an indigenous IFE requires huge amounts of advanced materials, techniques, expertise, Cutting edge weaponry needs testing, it needs ballistic setups, robust testing of the vehicle itself, the structure, electronics, there's so much involved, and none of them are easy tasks for even the most experienced defense companies as we see around the world. Despite the hurdles though, I do think there's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Companies like Tata and l &T have really stepped up and they've invested a lot of R&D in tr trying to at least showcase prototypes. But I don't think it's quite enough yet, and it's a little frustrating, I think, for Indian's defense world to see this vehicle not coming into fruition sooner. 
but when it's driven by a mix of private and public players, the project is obviously going to hit many snags. Several industry giants have really pushed to be contenders for this program and fighting for it. Let's start with Tata Advanced Systems. Known for its work in aerospace and defense, Tata has proposed a very versatile design featuring advanced composites for light armor, a 30mm autocannon, anti-tank guided missiles, and their focus is purely on modularity, which could make future upgrades easier, and which is a big key selling point for the army. Next, we have Larson and Tubro, or L&T, a powerhouse in India's engineering sector. Collaborating with DRDO, L&T has emphasized indigenous development. Their design incorporates a robust 600 horsepower engine, state-of-the-art targeting system, and amphibious capabilities, perfect for India's very difficult and diverse terrain. Then, there's Armoured Vehicles Nigam Limited, or AVNL, a state-run enterprise. While they faced criticism for slower progress, their deep experience in manufacturing armoured vehicles give them an edge in mass production and cost-effectiveness. Lastly, we cannot forget Mahindra Defence Systems, known for their work in armoured vehicles for internal security. Although they're considered a smaller player in this race, Mahindra's agility in design and manufacturing actually might surprise us. With so many players in the mix, competition is very fierce for this program, and the stakes really couldn't be higher, considering the size of India's army, how much infantry they have, and a vehicle that they're going to need to replace the BMP-2, which they have thousands of, you're going to want to put all your eggs in the wrong basket once, which did happen <laughs> with the Indian army's rifles, which I might actually make a video on in the future. A big issue with the indigenous rifles that they produce for their company, and they actually eventually went out and went to other countries to replace the thousands upon thousands of rifles they purchased. So I think this time they're thinking about it a lot more, which is why it's taking more time, but that's okay. I think taking a little bit more time to decide uh, is beneficial, but I think we're getting to that point now where they do have to commit. International partnerships do play a crucial role, though, in filling some of the technological gaps and accelerating these timelines, but how exactly do these collaborations help? Well, one notable example is the ongoing discussions with the United States about joint production of the Striker armored vehicles. Of course, these vehicles are known for their versatility and mobility, I've done a few videos on them myself, and they could provide some valuable insights into modern IFE design. While the Striker isn't really a direct replacement for the BMP-2, it does offer, I think, a bit of a template for advanced systems integration. India, of course, has also collaborated with Russia on several defense projects in the past. Although the geopolitical landscape has shifted, Russia's expertise in mechanized infantry vehicles like the BMP-3 continues to influence India's defense strategy. Additionally, partnerships with countries like Israel and France bring some of the cutting-edge technologies into optics, sensors, and weapon systems, enhancing that indigenous development process. For example, Israeli companies have worked with Indian firms to integrate advanced targeting systems into their combat vehicles. The FICV is actually looking into having active protection systems, and of course, Israel does very well with those systems. But international collaboration is certainly not without its challenges. Intellectual property rights, cost negotiations, technology transfer agreements often create huge roadblocks, nearly as many as you would if you develop something with your own internal government. Despite these issues, those global partnerships really do remain a vital part of modernization efforts if they choose to go with the FICV. Not everything can be produced locally within India, it just isn't going to happen. Be aware, though, that if India does go the FICV in this modernized infantry setup, it's going to be a huge transformation for not only the vehicles and designing and buying them and building them, but the infantry themselves. Electronic targeting systems, advanced warfare is just not really something that the Indian military has a lot of a customization to. Their air force is certainly getting stronger towards that, even their navy, but the armored field force is just not modernized. It has T-90 still, which I just recently did a video on, and although I have a huge respect for the T-90 and the BMP for that matter, they are just not up to date. And you can't just transfer armored warfare groups, infantry fighting vehicle commanders and infantry soldiers to go straight into a modernized piece of technology and hope for the best and that it just works. It's going to be a huge change for them, but it's important that they're able to because India has a huge challenge ahead of them when it comes to integrating these vehicles in some of their terrain. From the icy heights of Laktag to the dense forests of the northeast, a next generation IFV must navigate these conditions while offering a lot of firepower, some protection and mobility. And mobility, in my opinion, is one of those key attributes. India is a big country. It also has a lot of infantry to move. If you don't have a reliable platform, you're going to have real issues. 
Furthermore, regional dynamics demand a strong mechanized force. With China's rapidly modernizing military and Pakistan's focus on armored warfare, India needs, it needs advanced IFVs to maintain a strategic edge. And the BMP-2s just aren't going to cut it. The FICV is expected to provide that enhanced survivability against anti-tank weapons, which is a critical factor in potential conflicts, particularly with things like drones and ATGMs. Active protection systems is something that they're looking heavily into the FICV, which one or how it works is completely unknown. There's a lot of information about this vehicle floating around, and I'm sure I'm absolutely getting flamed in the comments already right now of the Indian followers just absolutely destroying me. But I don't have the ability to fact check a lot of this information. There's so much misinformation, so much conflict of research points to try and to look into this vehicle so deeply. I'm giving you a bit of an overview, but I'm sure I'm missing again a lot of things wrong. Please feel free to correct me in the comment section. But this modernization is a little bit more than just a fence. It's a bit of a signal to the world that India is actually taking this very serious and is looking onto itself reliance. That's a big part of regional security, being self-reliant, looking upon their own equipment, designing their own equipment, purchasing a lot of the equipment in their country itself is a big win. It increases their defense industry, they can produce more, um, they can obviously employ their people. That's a big deal. And I know it's not the most juicy or sexy information about this vehicle's program, but it does help. I mean, if there was a new vehicle coming to Canada and they're like, hey, we need 2,000 people to produce the next generation of infantry fire vehicles here, sign me up. I mean, I would love to do that job, and that's a big deal for any nation that wants to procure and modernize a fleet of vehicles. You get to work on them and take some pride in that. And I think India is a very proud nation. Uh, I think a little overly proud sometimes, the point they can be quite mean to people that a disagree with them, or even sometimes say, yeah, your country's great, but they may not adhere to your values or the way you think about India. It's an interesting dynamic. Again, I have no discredit to India at all. Now, if you're still with me, I've been babbling on for 10 minutes, but let's talk about this vehicle's actual key features. Now, it is going to have advanced armament, a 30mm autocannon for precise and high rate of fire against a range of targets, which I think anything above 30mm in today's IFE fleet is a requirement globally. If you're producing anything under 30mm, you're not really keeping up with modern standards, particularly with armor penetration. 25 and below, it's just not designed anymore for the IFEs of today. It does have guided missiles capable of neutralizing armored threats, including main battle tanks, is supposed to be using top-down attack missiles. India does have missile platforms that they could utilize on this vehicle, but it hasn't been defined as to which ones they're going to use on it. It will have a secondary armament of a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun and a optically remote controlled weapon system. Yes, it will have an RCWS with a 12.7mm heavy machine gun. The RWS is a big deal now in modern IFE fleets. I really appreciate and respect that because it's nice to have something that you don't have to open your hatch to operate on like the older AFEs or IFEs of the fleets that exist in the Western and Eastern worlds. It will have modular armor. Advanced composite materials provide a scalable protection, ensuring it can be adapted to different operational scenarios. Modularity is a big key deal here, which is what the Indian Army is looking for, like I had mentioned before. It is supposed to have active protection systems capable of detecting and neutralizing incoming threats, such as anti-tank guided missiles and even potentially drones. It will also have laser warning systems, so if there's a beam rider trying to attack you, it will alert the crew to hostile targeting and enable a rapid countermeasure. It should have blast protection, reinforced underbellies to protect against mines and improvised explosive devices, but it is not a V-shaped hull, so once again, you're kind of asking a lot of a vehicle in a tracked configuration to be in a V-shaped hull. You're taking a full force on that underbelly plate. Trust me, I've worked with the warriors in Afghanistan it's really tough to try and protect against IDs on vehicles of this kind. As I mentioned before, it's supposed to be amphibious, designed for seamless performance in waterlogged and rivered areas. Critical for India's terrain, but I have to say, if there was one thing I would remove from this vehicle's needs would be amphibious. It's just not something I would require out of an AFE of any kind. Um, it's a big change to the design and engineering of a vehicle when you start trying to make it amphibious, but I respect the fact that they're trying to make it so because, as I said, India has a lot of water objects and obstacles that they need to get through. It does have a fairly powerful engine, as I had mentioned, a 600 horsepower engine for pretty good mobility, but of course it's subject to which engine they're going to put in there. 
The suspension and drivetrain is also supposed to be very good. And again, don't really know what they will put in there, but I'm going to assume it's probably torsional bar suspension with some damper units on there. It can accommodate 11 personnel, including three crew members, driver, gunner, and commander, and eight fully equipped soldiers sat back to back. The interior is supposed to be, quote, spacious. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be the case looking at some of this footage. And have ergonomic seating with advanced communication systems for situational awareness. Whether or not they have kind of 360 vision blocks for this vehicle, similar to like the CV90, where you can actually see where you're about to disembark to, is yet to be known. It will have a network-centric warfare system, which allows the troops to equip each of one another with state-of-the-art communication systems to data link information back to the vehicle if you're on the floor, digging into a trench somewhere as an infantry dismount, or if you're in the vehicle communicating back to another platoon, battalion, or even back to uh, headquarters. It will have a electro-optical targeting system to enable both day and night operations, and finally it does have that modular architecture, allowing it to upgrade to different weapons and sensors for protection, or whatever the technology evolves to, and they think a little too much, for a change between a BMP2 and what they're trying to aim.